Hi everyone, my name is Katherine Hamilton. I'm a headache specialist at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I'm here tonight to talk about vagus nerve stimulation and how it's used to treat headache. So we'll just wait for some people to come in and join the session. So if you have ever wondered what is vagus, what is a vagus nerve, how do you stimulate it, and how is that related to headaches, then you're in the right place. And hopefully I can provide you with some background on vagus nerve stimulation and some of the evidence and trial data that show its benefit in headaches. So once again, for those of you who have come in recently. My name is Katherine Hamilton. I am a physician and headache specialist at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I will be discussing vagus nerve stimulation and its role in treating headaches, both migraine and cluster type headaches. So a little bit about vagus nerve stimulation. Most of you probably maybe have heard of it, or but, but probably don't really know what that means. What is the vagus nerve, and how do you stimulate it? So the vagus nerve is one of the 12 cranial nerves, and these are nerves that come out of the brainstem and have various functions. And the vagus nerve specifically deals with functions of a lot of the organs around the body and controls the actions of those organs. For example, it's involved in the gastrointestinal tract and digestion. It's involved with the heart, uh, heart rhythm and function. And specifically, the vagus nerve is involved with autonomic functions. And those are the fight or flight responses. So it controls things like heart. It slows the heart rate down um, when the body is going into calm mode. So that's briefly what, what the vagus nerve does. And the vagus nerve is very long. It takes a very long course. And one of the places that it runs is basically down here through the neck area. So what is vagus nerve stimulation and, and why would you stimulate this nerve? So vagus nerve stimulation was first developed or the concept was thought of in the 19th century, the late 19th century. So it was a long time ago. And it was initially used to try to treat epilepsy or seizures. The thought was that seizures arose because there was dysfunction in blood flow and the goal of trying to stimulate the vagus nerve was trying to slow down the heart and control seizures. So the first vagus nerve stimulator that was developed, which is a very crude device, was basically wires that were implanted on the vagus nerve to try to stimulate it and prevent it from functioning. And lo and behold, it did seem to help with seizures. Although, like I said, it was a very crude device and it wasn't many years later, about 100 years later, that a more precise device was developed, uh, a vagal nerve stimulator. And this, uh, this stimulator was also used to treat epilepsy or seizure patients. And this was a device that was also implanted. So it required a surgery, an invasive surgery, where you would go in and actually place electrodes on the vagus nerve. Um, that, were, that was a permanent device within the neck. Um, so, so this was developed in the and approved in the 1990s and was used to treat epilepsy patients, particularly those who had been not responsive to other treatments. And then it was used in epilepsy patients and they found somewhat luckily that in seizure patients who also had headaches or migraines that the vagus nerve stimulator seemed to help their headaches. This was not an intended purpose, but they found that even in patients who had chronic refractory headaches, they seemed to get better when they had the vagus nerve in, uh, stimulator implanted. So this led to development of a vagus nerve stimulator to target various types of headaches. And with, with more developments, there was a vagus nerve stimulator that was developed that was non-invasive, meaning it wasn't surgically implanted. It was the device that stimulated the vagus nerve from outside the neck. So it, it basically that involved having electrodes placed on the skin that could still reach the vagus nerve 
and still stimulate it. So this was a huge improvement because this meant that a patient didn't need to have an invasive surgery and have potential for complications like infection or the fail a failure of the device. And it could just be a device that would be pretty safe, um, safely used on, on top of the skin. So this is the device that has currently been tested and approved, FDA approved for various headache conditions. And I have a sample right here of what that device looks like. So you can see it's a pretty sleek looking device. It's the company that makes it is called GammaCore. And it's about the size of an electric razor, very small and, um, and easy to hold and, and transport. And basically it has these two electrodes that the patient would place on the area where the vagus nerve runs here in the neck. And you turn it on, turn up the frequency until you get to the desired frequency and stimulate the nerve for a specific amount of time, depending on what exactly you're treating. So you can see it's pretty, pretty easy to carry, pretty easy to use. Um, and like I said, it, the exact way you use it depends on what you're treating. So that's a little bit about how the vagus nerve stimulator was developed and how it kind of luckily was discovered to be helpful for headaches. So in recent years, there have been a lot of trials looking at using the, this vagus nerve stimulator for various headache conditions including migraine and cluster headaches specifically. So, so one of the first indications that it was used for was cluster headache, and that was the first indication that it was FDA approved for as well. For those of you who aren't familiar with cluster headache, it's a separate type of headache from migraine that involves episodes of very painful headaches, uh, usually around the eye, one-sided, with tearing of the eye, redness of the eye, stuffy nose, symptoms like that on the same side of the headache. These headaches tend to be brief, but very, very severe. It's been described as one of the worst types of pain people can ever experience. So cluster is much more rare than migraine. The lifetime prevalence is only about 1%, um, but it is a, a condition that is very difficult to treat. And there are really not that many treatments that are actually FDA approved and have very good level of evidence for cluster headache. And many patients, if they can't tolerate or if they can't take the medications available, are kind of at a loss and, and have to suffer with, with these horrible headaches. So it was definitely a need to find a better treatment for cluster headaches. So, so this was an exciting uh, opportunity for the vagus nerve stimulator. And there, there were studies done on on its use in cluster headache. And so the first indication that it was approved for by the FDA was for acute treatment of cluster headache. So when a patient has an attack, they can, when they, when they feel the headache coming on, they can use the device, again, turning it up to a certain frequency and, and waiting a certain amount of time. And that has shown to be effective in ending the cluster headache when compared to those patients not using a, a sham device, one that doesn't have the same um, amount of, one that doesn't uh, stimulate the vagus nerve. So that was very exciting. Um, and it's nice because again, it's not a medication, so it doesn't get into the bloodstream. It doesn't cause side effects such as sleepiness or waking or anything like that. It's all non-invasive. So, so this, especially for people who have very frequent attacks and might need to take a lot of medications like sumatriptan, this is a nice alternative. Um, and, and, and patients do find that it can help uh, end an attack when it happens. And re very recently, it was FDA approved for prevention of cluster headaches as well. So used as a, mean, as a treatment to bring down the frequency of cluster attacks. So this is also very exciting because there actually isn't any other treatment that's been FDA approved for cluster headache. There are other medications that we commonly use, but the evidence really, there's not, not, there's not a whole lot of evidence and a lot of patients can't tolerate those medications. So this is also a very exciting development. Basically for prevention, someone would use it twice a day 
do a certain certain type of stimulation and this has been shown to significantly lower the amount of cluster attacks per week compared to patients um, who are just using their regular medications, their standard of care. So that's a little bit about how it's used in cluster headache, um, which is, is definitely exciting. And then in terms of migraine, it was uh, approved last spring uh, by the FDA for use as an acute or abortive medication in migraine. So, so similar to what I was explaining in cluster headache, basically what a my, patient with a migraine would do is when they get their migraine attack, they would uh, use this to stimulate the vagus nerve. Um, in, in a lot of these protocols, it, revo it involves repeated stimulations separated by um, a certain amount of time. Um, but there is ev trial evidence that the VNS, the vagal nerve stimulator, decreases the pain level of a migraine at 30 minutes and 60 minutes after the use of the device. So there seems to be a significant improvement in migraine. Uh, interestingly, they did not find a significant improvement further out. Um, so that indicates that maybe it's, you know, better just just for that initial pain, um, this, but uh, that so, but it still was approved for acute treatment of migraine. So this is also nice for patients who have frequent migraines and who don't want to be taking as many as needed medications because there's there's a an upper limit of how many times you can use this per day, but it's pretty high, high enough that no one no one with migraine is probably going to get up that high. So it's pretty safe to use multiple times a day. Now, the, the main things to note are that, you know, this isn't, this device can't be used by everyone. Uh, for people with heart conditions who affecting the heart rhythm could be potentially dangerous, um, that, that would be a reason not to use it. If you have metal in your neck or some sort of implantable device where stimulating could potentially disrupt that signaling, um, that's that's a reason to to not use it. So there are contraindications. However, in in a lot of populations, it's it's very safe to use, and it's currently being studied for pregnant for patients who are pregnant, which is a very exciting exciting area because this is an area that there's a great need because pregnant women uh, have very limited options in their pregnancy when they have migraine or cluster headache. So this is potentially a very, very nice option for that population. Um, similarly, it's being studied for treatment of menstrually related migraines. So patients that tend to get worse migraines around their periods, which can be particularly difficult to treat. Um, there's some evidence that use of the vag vagus nerve stimulator can help with that. And again, that's a nice thing because you, you might have to be taking it several times, a, using it several times a day with those particularly difficult to treat menstrual migraines. Um, so those are some populations that are currently being studied. Um, it's also being studied and used for other indications outside of headache, um, certain rheumatologic conditions or uh, other medical conditions as well. Um, so, you know, there are really a lot of uh, potential ways this could be used. And quickly, I'll go a little bit into how it works because it was somewhat just a lucky break that we found that it works for migraine and, and headache, and it was really only in going back afterwards that we figured out why, or that there were theories about why it does help with migraine and headache. Basically, it's thought that by stimulating the vagus nerve, you're kind of quieting down the brain, particularly the type, the, the part of the brain where migraine and pain signals converge which is called the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. It's part of the brain stem. Basically, it's, it's kind of the pain center of the brain. And there have been studies showing that vagus nerve stimulation decreases some of those excitatory signals um, of, in, in that area of the brain, uh, thereby kind of calming down the pain signaling and, and decreasing um, the likelihood for, for headaches. So that's roughly, roughly how we think it works, or one of the mechanisms at least. 
And, a, you know, a couple of practical pieces of information before I start to take questions. Um, this is a relatively new device, so we don't have long, long-term data. Um, it was only recently FDA approved for the various indications. And it is one of, I, you know, I think the biggest limitation for most patients is cost. So the way this works is basically when you have the device, you're renting it or leasing it in a sense, and every month you need to reactivate it. So the cost per month out of pocket is about $700. So it's pretty steep. That being said, there are cases where insurance will cover it, but in not all cases. So, so that tends to be the biggest barrier for care. However, especially in patients who have cluster headaches, who might only get their headaches a couple months out of the year, um, or in patients who just really tried a lot of things um, or have reasons why they can't take medications, this is a nice option to have, um, but cost can, can be a limiting factor. So with that, I will open it up for questions. If anyone has any, I'll review some of the things people have said. All right, so we have some international folks tuning in, so that's great. Hmm, so someone said that neuromodulation devices, no neuromodulation devices are available in New Zealand, and that could definitely be an issue. Um, I'm, not, oh, I'm not sure of all the specifics of what's available in what country, um, but I know that is an issue that people brought up. Um, I believe even in Canada, it's more limited um, than in the U.S. So hopefully with more experience with these devices um, and as, as we accumulate more evidence and just with more time, there, there could be more widespread use in other countries uh, once, once they're approved for use in those countries. And someone was mentioning um, pregnancy, having Limit, limited medications that they can take. So again, this is this is a good in, potential indication in pregnancy. Although there currently is not any published data on pregnant women using the vagus nerve simulator, so you know we don't have a hundred percent certainty that it's safe. Um, but it would stand to reason that it's fairly safe because it's a non-invasive device. So it's not it's it shouldn't affect uh, the fetus. Um, in pregnancy, and it shouldn't have any uh, side effects like medications would that that could potentially harm the fetus. So we don't we can't say with with total certainty, but a lot of headache specialists feel comfortable using it in pregnant women who have migraine or headache. So someone asked about tension headaches um, in the back of the neck. So there is currently no um, indication for use of the vagus nerve stimulator for tension headache. It's different. Um, so sometimes when we think of muscle tension, there can be various stimulation devices that physical therapists will use, like a TENS device, um, which will be kind of electric stimulation over the muscles to try to loosen them up. This is different. This is specifically targeted to the vagus nerve. So it's not really going to affect the muscles or help with muscle tension. And it's not, it hasn't really been studied in tension type headaches. So if so someone asked about a metal rod in the back. I think each case might be a little bit different. I would speak with your doctor if you're at all curious or interested in using it um, because there, it's not necessarily that any metal in the body is a contraindication, specifically metal that, that might be near the device or interact with it uh, is, is potentially a problem. But, but I would ask your, ask your doctor to to see whether in your specific case that would be an issue.
So someone asked about the Cephaly device. Yeah, so that's a good question. How does this relate to the other migraine and headache devices that are out there? The three that, uh, that are used for migraine are the Cephaly, this device, and um, the transcranial magnetic stimulator. So they all work in very different ways. They all involve stimulation of some sort and what we call neuromodulation, meaning that they, that they help to, they kind of alter the, the nervous system in a non-invasive way. Um, but the, the way they do that is very different. So they have different targets. Um, and it's hard to compare them head to head because there haven't been any trials doing that specifically. Um, and, and they're used for slightly different indications. So for example, the, this vagal nerve stimul stimulator is not used for prevention of migraine, um, whereas other devices can be used for prevention of migraine. So, um, so different patients might respond differently to, to the different devices. Um, so if you've tried one of the devices and it hasn't worked, that doesn't necessarily mean that another device uh, can't be effective. So someone asked about nausea as well. Um, will this device help with nausea? And um, the, for migraine, in the migraine trial, looking at acute use, their main outcomes were looking at pain relief. And so it did seem to help with pain, but it also helped with associated symptoms of migraine, including nausea. So there's, there is a, basically the thought is that it's, it's helping with the whole migraine and, and not just the pain. So it should help with some of the, those associated symptoms. So someone asked, why is the price so high? I don't know that. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, what goes into making that price, um, but it is, it is quite high. Um, with sometimes, you know, with medications, at least over time, the, the price can drop as generics are created. Um, I don't know whether there's going to be change over time with the vagus nerve stimulator, but, you know, potentially with more use and more, more data, it's, hopeful that insurance companies might start covering it more. I would say that's probably a, a goal to hope for um, as opposed to the price dropping. But I, you know, I'm not sure what's going to going to happen in, in time. Um, and it, I, I'm assuming it has to do with the, the cost of, of the device and the, the technology is more expensive. Someone asked, does it hurt? That's a good question. So not really. Um, I've used it actually on myself and it feels a little funny. Um, and you actually want to get the stimulation up to the point where it's pulling the, the muscle a little bit in the face. So sometimes it looks kind of funny. It makes your mouth droop a little bit. And it, you know, you feel sort of like a, a tightness almost or a buzzing feeling, but it's not painful. It's not particularly painful. So someone asked, someone expressed concerns that as a nurse, they, they were under understanding that vagus nerve stimulation is potentially dangerous. So there are concerns that have been raised, um, particularly about the implantable vagus nerve stimulator, because there, you know, that's a that's a device that's permanent that's in there and if it gets turned on you know it's it in some cases it can be hard to turn off and there have been some cases um, of outcomes that are more serious that have been thought to be due to the device like cardiac um, complications um, however there's nothing like that that I'm aware of for the vagus nerve stimulator there really haven't been major adverse events that have been reported um, and I think that's because it's non-invasive so it's something that you control, it's on the outside of, of the skin. Um, so it's a lot less concerning than those invasive vagus nerve stimulators that are used for seizures. Uh, that's why you know, we consider it to be more safe. 
So someone talked, uh, asked about hemiplegic migraines. There would be no reason why this couldn't be used in people who have hemiplegic migraines or migraines with aura. Um, there's no contraindication in, in those patients, whereas certain medications like triptans are contraindicated. Um, so this could be potentially a nice option for, for patients with, with hemiplegic migraine, basilar migraine, these more complicated aura types. Someone asked, does it work on severe migraines? There, the population that was studied for migraine encompassed, uh, you know, different very varying intensities of headache. But as with most migraines, people have often moderate to severe headaches. So the data seems to imply that it should should work with severe uh, on severe migraines. Someone asked what types of insurance cover this. So I don't know the ins and outs of this either, and it probably differs state by state, and it's very insurance dependent. What I would say is if you're interested in using it, I uh, would talk to your doctor. Um, if they don't have experience with it, um, then they, you, they could con consider referring you either to a neurologist or headache specialist. Um, and, and basically, the the company is uh, is willing and um, and able to work with insurance companies. So if the doctor sends in the prescription form and contacts the company, um, they can potentially inquire about whether they're whether they can help with getting insurance coverage because the the company wants insurances to cover it. Um, certainly, they want patients to have access to it. Um, so it's they're motivated to help uh, with that process. Um, it can be a little bit of a, a tedious process with back and forth, and I've had experience with my own patients um, of frust frustration getting it covered. I should mention that for, for migraine, there is a uh, one free, free, a free one-month trial, um, so you can use the device uh, for free for one month to test it out. So that's nice because it gives you some ability to see whether it even works for you. Uh, the problem is if you find that it really works and then at the end of the month it's not covered by your insurance, that's, um, you know, that's challenging. But the month is set up so that it gives you some time to look into whether your insurance might possibly cover it. And actually for, um, I know this is for, for cluster headache, I believe it's for migraine too, I was just told um, that they're actually extending that to two months as long as you're in the process of trying to get it covered by your insurance. So you can use the device for free for two months and then while you're trying to, to look into getting it covered by your insurance. So someone asked, how do the migraine populations differ in studies for cephaly and gamma core? I'd have to go back and dig into the data a little bit. I don't my sense is that they are not significantly different. Um, the gamma core VNS was studied both for acute and prevention, both for acute treatment and prevention of migraine. Um, for prevention of migraine, it didn't meet its primary endpoint. There was there were trends towards it being beneficial, um, but it didn't meet the, the primary endpoint. So, so it ultimately wasn't uh, wasn't approved for prevention of migraine. So that's one difference between the cephaly and the gamma core vagus nerve stimulator. So to conclude, since it's uh, 8.30 now, uh, I talked a little bit about this, but basically if you are interested in learning more about the vagus nerve stimulator and the next steps on how to get it, um, there was a link sent out earlier in the chat um, by the American Migraine Foundation on more in, from the resource library um, to find out more. Ask your doctor about it if they're not if they're not sure, there, there's, a, um, there's a good website um, by the Gamma Core company um, that can, can walk you through a little bit more in detail what I talked about um, and the indications for using it. And it's a pretty simple prescription process. Basically, your doctor just fills out a form that's online and faxes it in, and then the company will send you a device. So, uh, so you know, if, you're, if your doctor isn't comfortable, I would, I would have them refer you to a neurologist or headache specialist if there's someone in the area. All right, so with that, I will 
sign off for now. Thank you all for tuning in, and I hope that you learned a little something about Vegas nerve stimulation. All right, bye.